Welcome everyone to Unity Live. I'm Emily Ghosh. I'm Brooklyn Rain. And we are the co-creators of Unity Live. And we just want to welcome everyone to this exciting occasion. We have Dr. Will Tuttle, who I had the honor of hearing speak. He was recently in Florida, um, him and his uh, partner. And, you know, I was just so struck by really the way that you are bringing so many, you know, different ideas and concepts together, you know, ecology, environmentalism, you know, politics, um, our food supply, you know, just such an intersection. And then also just your tremendous level of compassion and non-judgment. Non and so that really was the catalyst for this conversation today, which we're really excited about. Um, I'd love to read your bio uh, briefly before we, we dive in. And, you know, for those of us who are joining us live, you know, please feel free to ask any questions that you may have. Um, Dr. Will Tuttle is an award-winning speaker, educator, author, and musician. His music, writings, and presentations focus on compassion, intuition, meditation, social justice, and creativity. Creator of the best-selling book, The World Peace Diet, as well as over a dozen other books and CDs, Dr. Tuttle presents regularly, both online and at conferences and events throughout North America and worldwide. A former Zen monk with a PhD in education from UC Berkeley, his work has been extensively exploring and promoting intuition development, nonviolent living, meditation, healing music, creativity, holistic health, animal liberation, and cultural evolution. Dr. Tuttle, thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you. Great. Well, I appreciate your. Uh initiative in creating this uh, forum and thanks everyone for watching and for listening in great to be here wow. well i have got to know <laughs> about your journey as a zen monk because first uh, you know i like i was just looking at your picture and tapping into all the um beautiful your beautiful bio and all the amazing creations and things that you've brought in to, you know, to share with humanity and the all that is. Um, and, you know, your energy just radiates compassion and peace and, and Zen. So we would love to, if you would share a little bit with us about anything that you feel is really something, you know, on your heart that you want to share about your journey. And, and then specifically too, if you could touch in on the, on your experience as a Zen monk. Right. Yeah, sure. I'm uh, happy to share a little bit. I'm, what, what, you know, and people are, feel free to ask questions. But uh, in terms of my background and my journey, yeah, I really do feel very blessed. You know, I feel like a human life is a an adventure, and we have just a relatively short time here on this earth. I was born and raised in Concord, Massachusetts, which was the home of the American Revolution, and my father was really into it. He was a a minute man and we would go down April 19th Patriots Day and celebrate the revolution he would dress up with a lot of other men and uh, and, and uh, with their guns and, and send the redcoats back to back to Boston and celebrate the idea that we sh we're meant to live freely he, he owned a chain of newspapers so I learned from him a few things number one um, don't trust the media <laughs> because uh, I learned you know if you run a a newspaper, for example, you can't really run news that goes against the advertisers. And so I saw that from the inside, very interesting. And he was also going to be a doctor. So I learned, uh, don't trust the medical profession too much. He, he always said that. And uh, so I pretty much have stayed away from trusting the media. I haven't had a television since uh, probably 50 years and haven't been to a doctor probably in about 50 years either. But um, but I write in... in um, well, as a young kid, you know, I was just sort of typical in a lot of ways. We ate a lot of meat, dairy, and eggs. Uh, but I, I remember going away to a summer camp uh, in Vermont in the summers, and I would actually participate in the killing. I would do it myself, the chickens and the dairy cow every year. And I didn't like doing it, but I, I was indoctrinated uh, into the idea that we have to kill these animals to be healthy. When I went away to college, which was in the early 1970s in Maine, um, I really started exploring philosophy and started studying uh, meditation and Zen and yoga. It was during the Vietnam War era, and I 
you know, the whole war machine. And I started really questioning everything. And that kind of led me to Ramana Maharshi, uh, a sage from India, who said, you really should just find out who you are. That's the number one thing. Most people don't know. They, we think that we're this physical body or this collection of events and, and memories and likes and dislikes and that we're a thing, basically. And I remember really wanting to take a, a, a journey, a spiritual journey. And so right after college, um, to my delight, actually, my brother, my younger brother, Ed, had a similar uh, feeling. He agreed. He said, let's, 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 let's attain cosmic consciousness. That's what we wanted to do. <laughs> so that was in 1975. So I remember um, I talked to you know, my parents about it. And my father, to his credit, even though I was really kind of born and raised to take over this whole newspaper chain that he had developed, he said, every man must march to the beat of the drum that he hears. He quoted Thoreau and he gave us his blessing. And so we left. I remember walking down the driveway with my brother with uh, some fresh baked cookies from my mother. And we were going to walk all the way to California on a spiritual pilgrimage. That was our plan. And we walked for about a month and we got as far as Buffalo. And it was quite an adventure because we had no money and we had no out, you know, way of really taking care of ourselves. But we we just were walking and meditating and asking this question of who am I? And when we got to Buffalo, it was already getting really cold. It was October. So we just walked south all the way eventually to Alabama to a Zen center. And on the way, we stayed in all kinds of different places. We had really quite a miraculous journey. We never went too hungry. We managed to find food and work and trade. And, and we ended up for a while at a community in Tennessee when we got to Tennessee called The Farm, which was the largest hippie commune in the world back in 1975. And they were really following the teachings of Suzuki Roshi, who started the San Francisco Zen Center. So we, they would meditate together every morning. And they were all actually vegans, although no one knew the word vegan back then. They said, we're vegetarians and they didn't need any meat or dairy or eggs. And they explained to me why, which was not to, uh, to try to reduce world hunger and also because of the cruelty to the animals. And so I immediately agreed. I said, wow, you're right. And it was, but it was easy because there was 900 people living there and they were all vegan, right? And they're all, I mean, they call themselves vegetarians. But I was just eating what they were eating, which was vegetables and grains and legumes and lots of soy stuff back then. And so that was it. I've never eaten meat in my life since then. And eventually, we, well, my brother and I walked south from there to Huntsville, Alabama, because we heard about a Zen center there that we thought would be a, a good thing. Because we, we wanted to just meditate, just sit. And so we, would, we got there, and we were, we were able to. They let us just meditate eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. Every day, we just sat you know, for, I went for months just with not doing anything but meditating. And it was really uh, an amazing experience to just go deep in meditation and start to get some glimpses of what these ancient sages from Asia have been saying. And from, from the West, there's been a few too, um, that what we are is not this body. What we are is eternal consciousness that is manifesting through a physical vehicle. And there's a tremendous sense of uh, liberation that, that comes from understanding that more than just intellectually, but actually realizing that and what the ramifications of that are that nothing from the outside world is ultimately going to liberate me or make me happy or give me satisfaction. It really comes from an internal, uh, complete transformation of, uh, of awareness. And so uh, I ended up moving from there to some meditation, other meditation centers in Atlanta, and then came to San Francisco, lived in a Tibetan Buddhist meditation center. And that was really intense. I did a lot of long retreats. I translated some texts. I was able to present one to the Dalai Lama when he came and visited and took the Bodhisattva vow from him, which was really, it was great actually. And met a lot of really high lamas and worked with them quite a bit. And then eventually felt, found my way back to Zen. And there was a Zen center in Oakland, California. So I was living there and, and eventually uh, uh, another center down in Carmel, California. And I eventually went over to Korea. I decided to um, go there and shave my head and became a monk, a Zen Buddhist monk in a monastery in South Korea. That was in, in 1984. So I was in my, by then I was in my late 20s. So I pretty much spent most of my 20s just in these meditation centers doing a lot of inner work. And, um, and, and in South Korea, it was really great because it was a, 
a monastery that had a community like, uh, that had been practicing vegan living for about 800 years. Mm. You know, so I had this feeling of the ancient wisdom of compassion for all life. If we're really serious about creating a society of peace and harmony and unity and freedom and, and attaining some higher consciousness. So when I came back to the States, eventually I decided to uh, come back and go into the world again. And I got my PhD at Berkeley and was able to get a PhD, which was really great on um, educating intuition in adults. And so that was the focus of my research. And I ended up teaching college in the San Francisco Bay Area for quite a few years, courses in philosophy and mythology and comparative religion and, uh, and creativity and so forth. And then decided to just leave academia. And, 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 and I met Madeline in Switzerland a little bit after that, but just basically traveled, lived on the road for about 20 years, traveling all over North America and putting on concerts of original piano music, because I'm also a composer and a pianist. So I was coming out with a lot of CDs and people love the music, you know? So I was playing concerts and then doing workshops on intuition development and doing the Sunday morning service at, at these churches and uh, like Unitarian churches and unity churches. And uh, so that that's really, and then, so we lived in an RV for about 18 of those 20 years. I also lived in a 1971 Volkswagen bus for three years, <laughs> which was quite an adventure. <laughs> And, uh, and now we have a house in Northern California where for the last about, we're in our 10th year here uh, making a garden and, um, and just kind of building a food forest and, and getting more self-sufficient in food and energy and so forth and still traveling as, as best we can to spread the message, the good news really that uh, all of us human beings can thrive without causing suffering to, to other living beings. And, uh, to try to help people realize that we've all been wounded by living in this society and the whole animal agriculture uh, way of, of living, which kind of separates us from our wisdom and puts us as outsiders and, and afraid really of animals, of nature, of each other, to kind of get over the fear and realize we live in a beautiful, beautiful world and we can thrive and celebrate our lives here without causing suffering to other beings. So that's basically been it. I've had a lot of fantastic teachers. I'm very blessed. I, I feel so blessed in this lifetime to have met so many beautiful people and to be able to just give a little bit back from all I've been given really is a great honor. So thank you for, uh, for hosting this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What a beautiful life. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I feel very grateful. Yeah, it's true. I think it was one of the best things was just going through the sort of dark night when I was in college of realizing that if I just, if I just go into the usual thing that everybody does and take over a business or work in a corporation, I'm going to emerge when I'm in my sixties and I'll like, what happened? You know, I, I just, I just felt like it's so easy to get lost. The society tries to uh, suck our energy and our creativity and our whatever our, out of us and use us <laughs> and so i just left i my brother and i both realized we gotta we gotta we can't let let that happen you know and so it was you know we did a lot of things that were it took uh, i guess you could say took courage i mean just to, to go into the world without any money and just you know we did we live by dumpster diving and you know whatever we could do to get food but we were just, we just focused. We thought the most important thing is to meditate and just wake up and, and that's all that matters. And, and uh, but then I found, you know, like I remember we were, um, we, we would come into a little town, like we came into this little town in Kentucky somewhere in, in the very, very poor people. I mean, they were, the houses, some of the houses didn't even have a floor. They were just dirt. And, um, and, and they, we would you know, go and they, we would stay a lot of times in the church, we'd sleep on the floor of the church or, or something. We, we worked a lot through these little churches because they would give us a little food and we would, you know, we would help them paint the church or whatever. And we would, then we'd go on the next day. We just always traveled the next day and we didn't want to hang around anywhere too long, but um, they, they, just, they, they gave us, uh, they took up a collection and they, and, and they had us give a, a talk to the Sunday school, you know, and we said to the Sunday school kids, yeah, it's true. You know what Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added unto you. You know, just, just focus on the most important thing. Focus on your, 
your, your mind and your heart and creating loving relationships and understand that you're not just a thing, you're a spiritual, beautiful being. And so they, they gave us $30, you know, which was like back in 1975, that was quite a lot of money. I remember uh, we, we walked into this little um, cafe on the way out of town and, and, and ordered lunch. And it was for two people, it was like maybe, uh, you know, $14 or something. And, and I remember uh, we gave the, the waitress the, the $30, you know, we gave her a, a big tip and, and we didn't, cause we thought, you know, we don't want to hang on to anything, you know, every day takes care of itself. And, 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 and I found that we, if you, if we, li you know, live by that uh, in many ways, it really does work. It's like the idea is to not succumb to the victim mentality of fear that if I, Oh, if I don't do this, then I won't have enough. And, you know, but instead to just focus on what's most important on giving and understanding and improving ourselves and the universe will back it up, you know, as long as we're authentic and really uh, doing our best. I think uh, it's amazing how the, the doors open. You know, we'd have a little miracles happening all the time. The only time we were really hungry, we hadn't eaten for like a day and a half or something. We were walking along this road and there were like these two sandwiches wrapped up in plastic by the side of the road. <laughs> we weren't even that surprised. Like, oh, okay, here it is. You know, it was like one of those, it's like, think, it's just, it's just really amazing how, how if we go in the direction of our dreams, Thoreau said it. I remember reading Walden when I was in uh, college and, and I thought, gosh, I was, I learned to swim in Walden Pond. You know, I lived in Concord. I didn't know how great Thoreau was and Emerson. And he said, if you just go in the direction of your dreams, uh, that you you can build something solid under them, and that's the most. That's really the way to live a, a human life, where we're fulfilling a purpose. You know that we're here for a purpose, but we, no one knows what the purpose is except for us. You know, so we can't really let anyone else tell us what we should be doing with our life, because everyone has a different purpose, and and only we know what that is. And even we don't know it until we actually engage in the adventure of questioning and wondering and feeling into all the possibilities and just realize that virtually every force in our society is dedicated to inhibiting and blocking us from doing that. Really, it's a, it's a challenge, it's, a, it's tough. And we're all wounded from the time we're born by animal agriculture and the whole domination of the sacred feminine dimension of life, uh, not only in the outer world, but in the inner world. So to, re to resurrect all of that you know, within ourselves, it's really, uh, it's a challenge, but it's definitely worth the effort, I think. Yeah, so true. You know, it's interesting that you brought up swimming because I often think of it as swimming upstream. You know, when you're in, you're following your dreams, you know, you're going, there's, there are these forces, whether it's media or, you know, what have you, that kind of keep people stuck in, in sort of a status quo, but really this, you know, idea of moving and swimming upstream and following your heart is such, uh, you know, a beautiful gift to be able to do that. And, you know, you, you, you kind of bring up the, the idea of, um, you know, how we're raised as playing a part. And so I'm really curious to ask you about that, like in your experience, in your research, how much does our you know, cultural upbringing play a role. Um, have you found in, in you know, it, all of that and in, in including food and, and what we're putting in our bodies? Right, well, I, I wanna say, I think two things. One is, yes, it's absolutely enormous how, how, how our minds from the time we're a little, well, when we're in the womb still, I mean, as soon as we're born, uh, we are bombarded with messages and uh, stimulation and examples um, that are really, for the most part, harmful uh, in many ways. I mean, the, the culture has a lot of just sort of invisible, uh, sort of established violence in there towards animals and towards children and towards nature that we just naturally like, like we're really like little sponges, you know, we just soak up whatever culture we're in. If we're born in, Af in African tribe or, or whatever, we, we're going to be like those people. So we, become, so we take all that in, but also if we're say 30, 40, 50 years old, whatever we are, uh, we, are we have a tremendous capacity to, to completely heal all of that. I mean, to, to just to raise our awareness up and to, to um, feel, we don't need to feel bound by that. I mean, there's, we, have, we definitely have to do work 
uh, I've had to do work and I'm, and I'm sure, you know, we've all been wounded in various ways and it's hard to say who's been wounded more, you know, whatever, but you know, we all get wounded. So the whole idea is to just realize that the situation is workable. We can, we can heal the wounds, whatever they are. The best thing though, is to understand the nature of the wounding in a sense. It's like, if you have a rope and it has a bunch of knots in it, you have to untie the knots and one after the other, you know, and you have to untie these knots. And the more we untie the knots, the more the rope is like happy and flexible and it's, you know, it's useful. And so that's why I wrote the World Peace Diet in, in a sense, was because I realized no one has actually put it all together to see how actually we have this hidden spinning fury at the core of our culture which is animal agriculture, this massive killing of billions of animals uh, ongoing, and it's completely unnecessary. We don't need to do that for, for any nutrition or really for anything, but it's it not only de is devastating the outer world, but it's also really devastating the inner landscape of our consciousness because we're forced to participate in these mealtime rituals that reinforce attitudes that are going to be guaranteed to cause a lot of conflict and suffering and, and disease and violence in our lives. I mean, it's like when you study, you know, I spent so many years studying the world religions. I used to teach comparative religion and all the world religions essentially agree on the core teaching, which is whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others to just be loving, let others be free to be generous because when we sow those seeds, we get love, we get abundance, you know, for ourselves, but we also help create more of that in the world. And we're not separate from the world. We're, you know, this, like this, your idea of unity. I mean, every, it's, it's, um, the world is a mirror in many ways of our consciousness. So instead of trying to change the outer world, we change ourselves and we find we're sowing now seeds that come back in this way. So animal agriculture is this invisible activity that even people who are really serious about spirituality, about health, about environmental sustainability, about freedom and creativity and love and all these things, they're so, we're still programmed to, to order chicken and turkey and fish and to pay someone to stab animals all day, to, to pay for a system that wastes most of the grain and food that we grow feeding these animals and wasting resources and causing hor horrific pollution and just completely decimating the fabric of life. And then not only paying for all that, which is causing the problem when we take out our wallets, but then we actually eat that. You know, when we eat that, we bring it into our temple. And we don't realize that we're building a temple of beauty and love with bricks of misery and violence. And it's actually, it's like this thing that's covered up in our society. So um, to actually shine the light of awareness on this and then uh, move our lives in a different direction, is a great healing for our society and for ourselves. Probably the one of the greatest healings we can do, really. Yeah, I, love that. I mean, it really gives a whole nother sort of grander perspective on the, you know, you are what you eat, right? It's right. Like everything's energy. We're energy. We're frequencies. Those frequencies, you know, of trauma, etc., that have been experienced by those those animals are then passed on and brought in, you know, into our our cellular water and to our dna so yeah exactly yeah i talked about that in the world peace diet how there's all these different le levels and layers of toxins and animal-based foods from the residues of pesticide herbicide and fungicides and chemical fertilizers and then all the heavy metals and pcbs and dioxins and nuclear radiation everything else that's in the water all these animals the cows and pigs and chickens are eating fish and fish meal which concentrates heavy metals and or people are eating fish and then the dairy products and eggs concentrate all of that even much more. And then uh, we're eating all the, all the uh, hormones and antibiotics and pests and all these uh, drug, there's over 10,000 drugs and hormones that have been approved to be used on animals that are raised for food. So we're getting all these <clears throat> drug residues and then the naturally occurring toxins in meat, dairy products, and eggs, like IGF-1 growth hormone and casein, and even if it's somehow perfectly immaculate flesh and milk, which it never is, it would still be toxic, really. I mean, it's got, it's not, we're not designed for that, all that saturated fat and cholesterol and acidifying and inflammatory animal proteins and so forth. 
But then on top of that, <laughs> then you have the misery and terror and fear and pain and despair of the, that these beings are experiencing and actually not only contributing to that, but eating that, the, the reality of that. And I think to, to say that that's not a reality betrays the, the essential orientation of our society, which is materialism. We think that if you can't measure it in some kind of scientific instrument, then it doesn't exist. And this materialism is a direct result of animal agriculture for 10,000 years. If you, if you do animal agriculture for 10,000 years and you practice seeing beings as things, reducing beings to commodities, pretty soon the whole world is a commodity and we ourselves are commodities and everything is just matter. And you buy and sell beings by the pound. And we have more slavery of humans today than ever in history because we, we see each other as objects. That's what animal agriculture does. And it creates a mentality of materialism that takes away all the sense of purpose and meaning that would be inherent in our lives. When you have materialism as the basic religion of the society, which is what's happened in our world today, uh, people don't have a sense of meaning in their life. Uh, it takes it away. And that of course works very well if you wanna sell a lot of products, if you wanna make people afraid and make sure they buy a lot of pharmaceutical medications because they don't realize that their health is really a product of their way of living and their consciousness and their sense of purpose. You take all that away and then you have huge money going into what I call a military industrial meat medical pharmaceutical media banking complex. <laughs> and then they of course rule um, not only the government but also the media and the narratives and the messaging that we get and the education. I mean, I saw it when I was getting in Berkeley, I could see how these corporations are moving in and they just, they, they've taken over the educational institutions, they've taken over the media, the government. And so that's why what you're doing is so important by actually creating a, a forum to talk about uh, ideas that are not going along with the narrative of slavery, which is really the animal agriculture narrative of, of animals and it pretty soon of each other uh, to make, to make a, a real authentic uh, forum for uh, talking about these things and understanding the deeper structure of our society. That's such a great thing to do right now. So thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. I think that it is so important to create a safe space to talk about, you know, issues like this and, and with, you know, compassion and non-judgment. And I'll just share it like, you know, for me personally, I, I wasn't vegan my whole life. And, right. you know, I think that, you know, there was a, a sense of disconnection, which you hit on because when there is connection, you can feel the energy and the emotions. And, um, you know, this just came up in something that you were teaching recently is just how uh, personal a topic food can be regardless, you know, regardless, there's so much emotion that can be tied right. to, to food. And so like, just curious, and you know, you are such a compassionate being, um, you know, what, what have you found in terms of like creating a dialogue and a conversation that's, that's helpful um, in creating awareness, but not, you know, creating a sense of isolation? Right. That's a great question. You know, the thing is, when we usually when we go vegan, we think we've and we, and we get into it, we think, wow, this is so great. I want to, I want to change everybody. <laughs> everybody who's not vegan, I want them to go vegan because they're killing animals, it's destroying the world. I mean, it's, they'd be healthier, they'd be happier. So we want to change other people because, and make them more like us. And in a way that's really, it comes from a, from a good place inside of us, I think basically, but it's also in many ways a recipe for disaster because you know, if someone came up to me and looked at me and, and like, well, you know, I'm, I'm gonna change you and make you more like I am. You know, my, the, a natural healthy response to that is to, you know, put up your dukes and fight back. You know, I mean, you know, we don't, we don't wanna have someone coming up and trying to change us. And so I think the most important thing is to work on changing ourselves as, as best we can so that what we are uh, becomes a vehicle of what veganism is, which is loving kindness and respect for other living beings. So even the, even the thought of wanting to change someone, there's a certain little seed of violence in that thought of like, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna influence them and move them and change them in the way I think they would be better. And we don't know if we're totally wise. Like there's, there's the old saying in Buddhism of the, the very compassionate monkey who looked down 
and saw the fish drowning in the water and brought him up to the safety of the tree, you know, <laughs> now, that idea. You know, we, we may really think we're helping, but the thing is, you know, the more we can just understand what veganism actually is, that's one of the reasons I wrote the World Peace Diet was to give the big picture of the history and the sociology and the anthropology and the, the, the governmental, educational, nutritional, you know, all these different dimensions. Because the more we really see the bigger picture, then we can actually understand that we've also been wounded by this. Even if we're vegan, that doesn't mean we're suddenly perfect. You know? And I think that's one of the problems. We think, well, I'm, per I'm vegan now. I don't have to do anything. I got to change everybody else. You know? mm -hmm. And so we find in the vegan movement a lot of conflict because everybody thinks they're right. You know? and, and so um, I really uh, think that veganism is, an, is a never ending practice of more and more completely embodying and, and uh, getting in alignment with what veganism is, which is ahimsa, which is the old Sanskrit word that means nonviolence. So to actually have relationships, not only with the non-human animals that are based on nonviolence, but with uh, human animals, other people, so that we're actually living a life of loving kindness. And I think we can always do better in that. I mean, always we can be more generous, more wise, more loving, more caring, more an embodiment of love for other living beings, for other animals, human animals, non-human animals. So veganism in a way is an extremely lofty goal. I mean, it's like full, complete enlightenment where we just become uh, a, 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 not a cell, I don't wanna say selfless, but just a vehicle for universal compassion for all life. And, we, and we've opened up to wisdom in a way that we understand what that actually, how that would operate. But it helps us, I think, to um, have the energy to do the inner work and to um, question the, all the narratives in our society. And that can be a daunting task. I've noticed, uh, you know, in the vegan community, a lot of vegans really don't want to do that, which is fine. You know, we, we'll do it in our own time. But to question the narratives of all kinds of different things and to really keep an open mind about what's going on in the world and um, to uh, work on changing myself and then bringing a positive message. I think veganism is, is very positive. You know, it's, it's not about tearing down something. I think, uh, you know, Buckminster Fuller was, I think was right when he said, if, you, if I try to destroy a system that's, yeah, admittedly it's obsolete, it's uh, violent, it's, re it's ridiculous animal agriculture, but, but if I'm going to attack it and fight it, uh, in many ways, I become like it, you know, I, I take on those qualities. And so that's one of the things I love about veganism. It's not merely attacking and, and condemning a horrible system of violence towards animals and hungry people and slaughterhouse workers and indigenous people and wildlife. I mean, it is all those things, but it's actually a beautiful creating of another way of living based on beautiful, delicious vegetables and fruits and nuts and grains and seeds and growing them organically and veganically in harmony. And how do we do that? And how do we create communities uh, that are decentralized, uh, that are based on compassion and kindness and educate our children to love and honor and respect animals and nature and each other and create beautiful arts and crafts and, and build a world that reflects our, our true potential. You know, it's like this beautiful, wide open, uh, possibility of co-creating a life of harmony and peace with others that are based on these basic principles that are universal spiritual principles and we can do it we need to do it I think now more than ever we can see we can't keep going this this increasing centralization and increasing fear and war and disease and all of that it's really that's what animal agriculture it's almost like in the death it's death throes I mean it's, it's like bringing us right to the brink and so now it's especially important that we uh, vision a positive future and work in a loving way towards that uh, without, like you say, without judgment or criticism, because everybody's been wounded, you know? So if someone's wounded and they lash out at me or, or whatever, I mean, I, what point is that if someone's wounded to kick them and yell at them and, you know, we, when someone is wounded, you try to be loving. We have to be as loving as we can, I think, really. And that's the challenge. Well, so beautifully said. Um, 
you know, I know you mentioned, and I'm so curious um, about the food forest, um, and you know, and you know what your um, expression of a, a food forest is, you know, versus maybe perhaps you know uh, uh, what we most often know as the garden, or is it right. one of the same? Yeah. yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, we, this is something that's been getting more and more important. Uh, and it seems like it's it's very practical. And we don't have a lot of land. We just we only have like about a quarter of an acre, which isn't very much. But we have. But the nice thing about a food forest is it's vertical, right? You have so we planted a lot of trees. We pl actually every year we plant more trees. So we've planted seventy trees by now, fruit and nut trees here. And so they, they go up and create kind of a canopy, which is nice for, um, for a lot of the plants that need some shade. And then we, we've been gradually building. In fact, today I built the number six um, uh, raised bed uh, for vegetables. And so we, because we have to protect them uh, from certain critters. <laughs> so, so anyway, so we have, you know, so we have, you know, beds underneath that of vegetables. And then we have berry bushes, you know, scattered around. And then we have uh, things that grow in the ground, deeper uh, garlic and horseradish and things. So this is like this multi-level. So you really get a lot, of, you can get a lot of food out of a relatively small space. And the nice thing about it is that it creates a whole ecosystem that's very beautiful. I mean, it attracts uh, lots of beneficial insects. You know, we try to, you know, create harmony and build up the soil. Then we can recycle everything. You know, we can recycle all of our food scraps, all of our, actually, we read a book called um, Liquid Gold, which is about urine. You know, the human urine is full of nitrogen. It's really like, don't waste it, you know? So we have a special system where we dilute it and it goes onto the plants. And the plants actually get that information. Plants are enormously intelligent. And I mean, much more intelligent, I think, than we are aware of. And so when, you, when we really establish a relationship with these trees, like we're doing over the years, and they're getting the information of our of our urine and of our being and everything just working. They more and more get to know us as as and and they and more and more. Uh, the ancient wisdom, anyway, is that they they the, their food becomes more more and more medicinal for us as individuals. And so it, it's it's very interesting. It's like when you grow your own food and you and you do that. It, it, it's. Um, it's like, that's really the circle of life, the, you know, life feeding on life or life feeding on love, because the more love you put into these trees, the more they, more they just give a huge harvest, you know, they give a lot <laughs> and, uh, and then you get even more and then you give more. And so it creates this positive feedback loop. And I really saw that when I was in Hawaii, there was a guy there who planted a, a breadfruit tree. And he, he said, when you look at my body, about 60 or 70 percent of this body is that tree right there <laughs> so i planted that tree and it just grew and and i you know and, and usually a, a breadfruit tree only gives breadfruit for about uh five or six months this one gives it for like 10 months of the year and i can bake it and, and steam it and all this stuff and so he said every day i'm eating breadfruit and the more the more i eat the more i get and so i think that that's a feminine wisdom of the the way of of giving and planting and nurturing seeds and then working in harmony with the natural abundance of the earth and of the seasons and the sun and the moon and the rain and the wind and the stars. It's this idea that we live in a naturally abundant universe. If we plant seeds and tend them with love, we can create a garden, which is a space of love and healing, and it will tailor itself to us. And, and um, this is a complete antithesis of animal agriculture, which was really never women's work. It was men's work. And it brought out the worst in the men, unfortunately, because of course the animals resist. They don't want to be sexually abused and have their babies stolen and be killed and be enslaved. And so you have to just do this violence. And so now we're in a society which is based on animal agriculture. And so we're all basically eating food, even if it's vegan food, plant-based food, very often it's raised in animal agriculture ways, right? They use the monocrop grains, you know, and, and um, a lot for animals, but even for, for humans, you know, and they use pesticide and herbicides and fungicides. They use all this stuff. So that's why I think it's so great to try to support farmers who are working more in harmony with nature that are organic 
veganic if possible. Like we don't use any bone meal or blood meal or manure or anything that would harm the animals. Or we really do our best not to kill any insects. We try to make it like a, a sanctuary for all living beings and the food you know, comes out of there. And I think um, we can support local farmers at farmer's markets, get to know them. We do that. We have a farmer's market here. So we, sometimes we sell our food, but usually we're buying from other people. And um, I think that establishing that relationship with the earth is very, very uh, important. And, and we have this idea that farmers are kind of very low. It's like, like a low esteem job. It's like way down there, you know, who wants to be a farmer, you know? And I think it should be one of the highest <laughs> because, you know, really growing food for people, that's a sacred thing. I mean, food is our most intimate connection with nature and with our you know, society. So people who grow food, if, if they can be supported in doing it in a, in a way that's uh, loving and sustainable, um, that creates massive benefit. And the great good news is we could feed everyone on this earth if people ate an organic vegan diet on a fraction of the land. It doesn't take much land. I mean, we're growing a huge amount of food in a tiny little quarter of an acre. I mean, think if everyone, if everyone in our neighbor, we have like 2000 houses around here in this area in Southern Lake County in California. And like, there's only like probably out of maybe, maybe 20 have a garden, you know, like nobody has a garden. We have, we're probably the only one with a food forest in this whole place. So the whole idea is if, if everyone would do that, we, would, we could be much more connected to the earth. We would recycle. We, we could teach our children uh, these things. And I think veganism would thrive naturally. I think kids would, would get, begin to respect uh, vegetables and fruits and nuts and grains and seeds and see how potatoes and sweet potatoes and how you can grow them and eat them and trade for them with the other people and uh, be, become more decentralized and more self-sufficient. Become, becoming self-sufficient um, for food is a great uh, freedom and a great power that I think is gonna be more and more important as the years go by here. And uh, if you wanna have quality food. So uh, I, this is a big thing. I think it's really uh, one of the newest things. And Madeline, my wife, Madeline, is, um, she's a, she loves to garden and she has a lot of experience from when she was in Switzerland. And she studied with some great people there. And we've learned a lot from, when we lived in our RV, we traveled. We, that's one of the great things living in an RV because we just traveled all over the United States. We met amazing food forest people, like some up in Canada, some in Oregon, some in Florida, different places. And we just learned, you know, and then finally we got our own piece of land. Now we can do it <laughs> ourselves, you know, so we can learn from each other. And I think that's why we're on this earth is to learn from each other, to le really learn from each other. Absolutely agree. And I think it's that hands-on connection that is so important, you know, right. Right. And, yeah. Um, I'd love to go back to something that you said, which is about the embodiment of, of being vegan, which I thought was really beautiful. And, you know, because uh, it, it's true, like you can be vegan and, you know, not necessarily healthy. So there is, you know, this this endless continuum of of health. And so I'd love to ask you just about some practical, you know, um, tools that that you in, integrate into your daily lifestyle for health. And, um, and also, you know, one other question that I have is about, you know, say somebody is not vegan, um, but wants to make some, you know, changes in their, in their diet and their lifestyle, would you recommend, you know, jumping into being vegan or kind of making gradual changes? What would be your recommendation there? Right. Yeah, that's true. You know, get <clears throat> learning how to be a healthy vegan. Uh, it's a, definitely a learning curve. And, and there's, um, you know, I've been a vegan since 1980, so that's 42 years now. And I have to say, it's I'm still learning. You know, it's it's fantastic. But but uh, uh, the main thing is organic is really important. I think nowadays because glyphosate is on everything. So gly glyphosate is a broad spectrum antibiotic, and it's not only destroying the 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 um, the, the basic uh, m um, microorganisms in the soil, but also in our own body. Uh, the microflora. So uh, organic is really important because without that, you're getting some glyphosate it, and, and it's also carcinogenic. I mean, it does all kinds of terrible things. So organic and as much as possible, whole foods that are not uh, processed with, with, um, with artificial flavors and preservatives. And so reading labels, I think is important. So as much as possible to transition 
you know, I know it's nice to eat some vegan uh, ice cream and vegan <laughs> hot dogs and vegan fish sticks or whatever, but be careful because those foods come out of factories. And I think factory foods that come out of factories, we try to minimize that now. I mean, but, you know, we've been doing it a long time, so we've had time to, you know, adjust. So, but, to, but that, but to understand that you, the more you move away from factory foods <laughs> and, you um, and buy vegetables, and, you know, or or you know, or grow them yourself, and fruits and nuts and seeds wow. and and grains, and potatoes, sweet potatoes. It's, you know, it's important to get enough calories. A lot of people go vegan and they think that they just have to get protein. You know, they don't have to worry about. So they're so they're afraid to eat calories. I mean, and to eat carbohydrates. And uh, carbohydrates, if they're complex carbohydrates like potatoes and sweet potatoes and whole grains. Uh, they're great. I mean, that's the fuel that our body runs on. So we, we, are, we're, we eat about 50, maybe 50 to 70% raw, I would say. Uh, I think it's good to have quite a bit of, you know, raw or, or fresh foods, but, but plenty, but, but you can have, you know, like our, our supper is usually more uh, potatoes or sweet potatoes or new pasta or, uh, corn or you know rice or quinoa or millet or kasha or something like that um, because there's a lot of energy in grains you get a lot of energy you get and, and really if you don't put a lot of oil and fat on it you're not going to gain weight i mean i it, it's really um it's easily it's easily metabolized so just understanding some of those basic things uh i think is helpful and, and don't worry too much about getting enough protein, you're going to get enough protein. The, the hospitals are filled with people that are there because of getting too much protein, which is really makes acidifies our tissues. Yeah. So, uh, so the thing I think with nutrition is to understand the basics that it's not that complicated if we eat a whole organic foods, whole organic foods, uh, mostly in, a, in their natural state, um, we're going to be getting healthy. But the thing is, we, we may start cleaning out and so you may feel worse, you may get sick. Sickness is not sickness. Sickness is good, it's cleansing. <laughs> you have a, have a new word. Usually when people get a rash or a sore throat or runny nose and all these things, headaches, uh, it's because their body's cleansing. And so instead of stopping that and say, oh, I gotta go back to eating meat because I'm not feeling well. No, let, let it go through, let yourself go through that process of cleansing because fruits and vegetables are natural cleansers. So they're gonna, you're gonna clean out a lot of old, heavy metals, dioxin, all kinds of pesticides, whatever will come out and let it go. And so um, let yourself cleanse, but then also realize it's not just what you're eating, it's how you're eating. So as much as possible, really take time to, to prepare the food with love uh, and appreciation and eat it mindfully. We try to really, when we're having meals, we don't ever watch television or do something. We, we don't talk about conflicted things we really try to have pleasant conversation enjoy the food enjoy each other really have a have it be a celebration you know eat, eating food with with mindfulness and, and like the in the old days people would really at the end of the day they have a meal and they really share and be and have a sense of gratitude that really makes it i think much more nourishing for us and so it's not just what but also how and then also see that food is not just the food we're eating physically it's also everything we take in so I, we, we notice a lot of people are putting on all kinds of stuff on their skin, like creams and shampoo and sunscreen, full of chemicals, toxic chemicals, toothpaste. I mean, so much stuff. Just really be aware that that stuff is toxic. There's so many talk avenues for toxins <laughs> to get in. So be, be aware of your personal care products. Be aware of the, what you're using to clean your house with. A lot of these things are toxic. What you're doing your laundry with. I mean, we see so many people that are very conscious with their food and they have all this other stuff that's like really not good. So try to have a big picture. Also your water, your air, you know, and your pans that you're cooking in. Um, it's, a lot of people are you still using Teflon and aluminum and all kinds. I mean, I know people that are chronically sick just and they change their pans and they, they take they care of it. So buy some good quality surgical steel pans, just a few a couple of pans are enough just to cook your food that are not gonna be leaching heavy metals and all who knows what. Uh, all these things are, are important to understand and then realize that uh, what else, the other way we eat is through our emotions and our relationships. I think a lot of people are unhealthy because they're in somewhat toxic relationships or they're frustrated or 
angry, or they still haven't processed their anger toward their parents <laughs> or whatever. So um, to really be monitor your thoughts and your relationships. And the more we can make uh, healthy relationships and take uh, responsibility for the quality of our relationships, remember that everyone we're relating with is wounded. And so if they're going to say things, they're going to upset us because they can't help it. I mean, you know, when people are hurt, they that's what happens. But to try to just respond with, you know, the more they send out anger, the more we send out love. This practice, there's a practice called the four Viharas, which is love, compassion, joy, and peace. Just when you're driving, like when I'm driving my car or just taking a walk or something, just send out love, compassion, joy, and peace to everyone, to the animals, to people you can see, people you can't see. You know, we can be a radiating center of loving kindness and compassion it doesn't cost anything and it really helps other people around us they'll feel it on some level and we'll we'll feel the transformation in ourselves instead of getting angry if someone cuts us off in traffic the natural response will be oh yeah i love you it's okay <laughs> you know we don't have to take anything personally we can practice the more we practice something the better we get at it i you know i had to learn that when i i was raised playing the piano you know and my father said yeah you can, yeah, I'll, I'll give you lessons, but you've got to practice every day. And I had to write it down, you know, on the, on the chart in the kitchen. But I'm so glad I did. I learned that when we practice something every day, regularly, we develop a capacity, we improve. It's all about practice. Our life is a practice. So we can practice things that are not good, or we can practice things that are uh, beneficial. And that's what brings health is like creating an internal locus of health uh, based on joy. You know, the basic feeling that our, at the core of our being, there's this bubbling spring of joy that's always there. It doesn't need any reason. We don't have to win the lottery or have somebody say something nice to me. I can be joyful for no reason at all, just to be alive and look open my, you know, just to see or feel or be aware, right, is a, is a cause for, for joy. And then I can actually relate to other people and I can actually maybe help them be loving and learn and grow and contribute. I can be grateful. I can have a sense of gratitude every morning when I get up. This is what really creates health. It's the, every cell in our being is fed by that because we have a feeling that we have a purpose, a unique purpose, and it has to do with our consciousness. And so our food comes out of that. We, we choose foods that bring more love and healing into the world. And we try to support people that are doing that to create more of that and all the food, all the media that we're consuming. We're consuming media all the time. We're consuming you know, stories. Uh, so that's why I haven't had a television in 50 years. I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't wanna, I know that, that that is typically very toxic. And, uh, and so we can create our own media like, like we're doing right now, right? We can uh, create uh, and, and we can partake of things that are helpful. So the music, you know, I love, I mean, another thing that's I think really healthy is like every morning I meditate for an hour at least, and I do yoga and uh, other practices for another hour, yoga, tai chi, qigong, exercise, take a swim. I ride my bike down to the lake. And I always swim every day. If it's cold or hot, it doesn't matter. Get in the water and swim around because, you know, connecting with nature is so important if we want to be healthy. And then I come back and then I play the piano. We have a grand piano. Finally, you know, I get this grand piano, so I play. And then Madeline joins with me on the silver flute. We play together. So, you know, creating music, you know, uh, together, doing something creative with other people is, is a great thing, really, for, for being healthy. I think the more we can create, connect with cre our own creativity, however that is, uh, through gardening, through writing, through music or art or whatever, cooking, whatever, whatever, dancing around, whatever you want to do. And then, um, and then, and then uh, connecting with nature is really important to be healthy. If we're not connecting with nature, if we're stuck in artificial lighting and artificial colors and artificial shapes and looking at our computer and cell phone all the time, how are we going to be healthy? I mean, we're, our physical body and our being is, is part of the cosmos and the earth. So it's really helpful, I think, to take time every day to get out there and take a walk or take off our shoes, connect with the earth and, um, and connect with our purpose also, you know, really get a sense of a purpose. Maybe have a journal. I write in a journal every day. You know, I think it's, it's a nice practice to just connect in and feel into uh, what, what's, what, what's what been going on in my life and my inner life and outer life and reflect on things. And, um, but, but, but really taking time every day to connect with silence, I think is very important. Silence is the key in many ways to good health because 
we're bombarded with so much input. And if we don't take time to just sit and, and watch our breathing and be aware that what I am is the observer, the witness of everything that's arising, we're not just this body, you know, we're infinite and eternal consciousness that is vivifying this outer appearance. And uh, we're taught by our society to identify with matter, with this physical matter, which is, which is gonna just go back to the dirt again. So that's ridiculous. I mean, like we know as we're not that, we know we are awareness. We're not just matter. And this lie that we're told in school that uh, we just evolved out of the dirt, I mean, that's if you want to really dominate and exploit people, that's a great way to do it because that takes away everybody's uh, basic sense of confidence in themselves. So they're going to definitely want to buy a lot of products so they won't, so they'll have some kind of sense of security and they're going to need a lot of drugs because they'll be miserable and they'll be sick and so forth. So we have to reclaim the narrative, reclaim our, our, our true nature, which is, which is health. You know, our true nature is real health, which is eternal life actually we are we're never born and we'll never die so we're once we have that feeling and we're and we're and we're just feeding ourselves with that idea right i mean they're they're happy to you know if we want to run a few miles they're happy to cooperate you know okay let's run a few miles you know whatever it is we'll have our and we have energy you know and we have whatever we you know it takes to do what we want to be doing with our life and uh, I think, you know, food is important, but there's all these other dimensions. So when people say, well, I'm vegan, but I'm not feeling well, well, there's a lot of <laughs> other stuff going on here. <laughs> and we got to be aware of all of that, really. Yeah, I love how all inclusive, you know, you share health comes from, you know, from all directions of our existence. Yeah, here. yeah. so it's so important um, because I feel like that's just another sort of distortion, right? That sort of single, singular focus, just food. And um, yeah, it's just- Yes, yes, this kind of reductionistic approach. Like we try to reduce everything down to one cause. Mm -hmm. We have to realize that everything is interconnected in amazing ways. And, um, and that it's not just matter, it's, our, it's the being that we are and, and the quality of our consciousness. So, but, but the food will affect our consciousness, right? I mean, what we eat, what we drink, uh, what the media we're taking in, it all affects our consciousness. So uh, it's important to be mindful and also our relationships. We become very much like the people we hang out with, you know? So that's an important thing. It's called right association. And it's important. I know, I know in the, like in, when I was a Zen Buddhist monk, that, that's one of the basic Buddhist teachings is really to try to associate with people who will, are on the same path spiritually so that we can, uh, especially in the beginning when you're like a young plant and you're kind of vulnerable and kind of weak, then you gotta you know, be protected a little bit. And I think uh, it's important to you know, choose our friends and acquaintances wisely and realize that we, we very much you know, become like those we are around and try to be a positive influence on others as well. Yeah. Such a well-rounded and beautiful sharing and wisdom. I feel like we all just were nourished in all layers of our physical, mental, emotional, and spirit bodies by your, your wisdom and grace. Yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks so much. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to, if you have, if, I don't know if we're out of time here or what. Well, you know, I'm curious. I One question that I have is, you know, I know that people can get the World Peace Diet, which is an incredible book, but also, you know, if there are those that are feeling called to go deeper, um, can you share a little bit about other avenues of exploration? Yes, uh, happy to do that, thanks. Now we're uh, basically um, happy to work with people who wanna go deeper with the ideas in the World Peace Diet. We have an online training uh, called the World Peace Diet Facilitator Training Program, which a lot of people have gone through, many hundreds of people. And, and, and it's very nice because you can actually create your own study group if you'd like to do that in your community, wherever you live and study the World Peace Diet, or just use it as a foundation for um, maybe being a coach or, or having your own little cooking class or just talking to your friends. It's basic, basically focusing on two main things. One is 
how to thrive as a vegan in a not yet vegan world. You know, what, how do we actually do that? And the other is how to be effective in our advocacy. And a lot of it goes along with what I've been saying to, to really hold the space of what veganism is and to understand the big picture deeply and to incorporate that understanding. So it gets down kind of to the cellular level so that we're embodying uh, veganism. So our message is congruent. And we have a, um, a first Thursday and a third Thursday of every month, uh, Zoom calls with everybody who's going through that program or people who are alumni, uh, where we want it, we share ideas and do meditations together and so forth. So there's an actual pretty um, active community that's based mainly in the United States, but there's people that join from Europe and other places too, uh, in Canada and so forth. So. Um, you're all welcome. Anyone's welcome to uh, explore that. You can go to our website, which is just worldpeacediet.com uh, or my name, willtuttle.com. We have uh, videos of Madeline's intuitive kitchen where she shows how to prepare these kind of foods I'm talking about, the whole organic foods. We have videos of our garden, of, of, of our music uh, and art and, that, and just yoga and lots of different things and lectures, of course, and interviews and um, so we have a lot on our website of information and our uh, lecture schedule. We actually, you know, when we lived in an RV, we were about half the year on the road, but we're still about four to five months on the road giving lectures. Uh, we'll be coming to Florida again, probably this, later this year. Yeah, uh, well, so. we look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I'd love to end just by asking you, you know, you have um, a, a chapter, one of the last chapters in the in the book that's um, called Living the Revolution. And it really talks about everyone being, you know, this unique puzzle piece. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about, you know, what, what you mean by that. Right. Well, you know, that's the thing. The um, there's always this underlying idea in our society that some people have more of an impact than others. Some people are more successful than others. Some people are sort of better than others. You know, <laughs> they're more famous. They're more wealthy. They're whatever. And I think um, it's so important for us to kind of do the best we can to let go of this comparison with others and tune into our life, our unique um, gifts that we, uh, talents and abilities, and and our yearnings. Really, what we feel drawn to contribute. And just know that that is as precious as anything. I mean, you can't say that Gandhi or Mother Teresa, or whoever you want to say, you know, did more than you did. I mean, if we if we touch another person in a positive way and, and contribute our unique piece to the puzzle, because that's the thing. It's like we've got this puzzle, uh, uh, and we and I can I think we we can all see it. It's like it looks pretty daunting. It's like it looks like humanity is not doing a very good job at putting this puzzle together. We keep creating more disease and more conflict, you know, but, but it is possible, but if it's only possible to solve the puzzle if each person contributes their piece of the puzzle. And um, I wrote a book also called um, Your Inner Islands, The Keys to Intuitive Living, where I talk about music. It's kind of the same thing. It's like, when I sit at the piano, there's 88 notes there, 88 keys. And like, which is the best key, you know? Well. They're all, they're all there. They're all, they're all equally important. And the neat thing is that like, if I was, if I was only say, well, this is my favorite note. I'm just only going to play this one note, you know, um, I, I couldn't make beautiful music, right? It would just be this one B flat, right? And the thing is um, that, that one note by itself doesn't have a lot of power, you know, by itself as a lone isolated note. But the neat thing is that if I'm playing the piano and all the notes are being used, then that one note in a certain passage can be so deeply touching. You know, and where does that power, where does the power of that one note come from? It comes from two things. It comes from all the other notes and, and the context that we have. So that's very important that each one of us is an individual alone and isolated. In a way, we don't have that much power, but in the context of all of us, each one of us, each one of us singing our own unique song, each one of us playing our own unique note. Because if that little B flat note, when it was a baby note, had been taught by its parents, well, you know, B flat notes, 
they don't get ahead in the world. You should be a B or maybe a B a C, but don't be a B flat. <laughs> you know, then I'm going, I go to play the B flat and it's not there. You know, it, it's, a, it's a big problem. So the whole idea is to find our note, just find it and sing it out. You know, that's, the, that's what the world needs. That's what the, the master composer needs, all the notes. And not to think that one note is more beautiful than another. They're all part of, the, of the, what can create, co-create um, the beautiful melody that we're here to really be part of, I think. And so um, that's the main point. We each, I think each of us has a unique song. You know, it's so neat how in Africa, I think it was, there's some tribes where when a woman is pregnant and she's ready to give, getting ready to give birth, um, she goes off by herself and by herself and she listens to hear the melody that she feels is the melody of the child that's going to be born through her. And then when she hears that melody, she goes back and teaches it to everyone in the, in the community. And then as the baby's actually being born, all the people that are there helping with the birth, as the baby comes into the world, they all sing that melody. <laughs> you know, it's just, wow. you're welcome here, you know, and this is your song. And then when they get married, they all sing that melody. When the person passes away, they all sing that melody again. Mm -hmm. You know, and that that that's such a beautiful idea. You know that we we can we can honor that unique melody in each other and sing it for each other and respect it. And each one of us has that. And uh, we can, when we contribute that, we make um, the whole world. Uh, you know, m make it easier for everyone to to do the same thing. It's so amazing! So beautiful. Wow. I feel so bliss, blissful and joyful and fulfilled from our yes, so time much, with you. So much, yeah. love, so much gratitude. This has been such an amazing share. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for all that you do. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Thanks, everyone. And um, look forward to doing it again whenever you have a chance. Yes, yes look forward <laughs> to that, too. Thank you. All right. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, I'll see.